Quality Control Manager of OWL Precast, five years materials testing and inspection at Western Technologies, one and a half years in cement lab at the Central Materials, two and a half years auditing I-15 core project, and the last four and a half years in his current position as precast manager for UDOT, and he has six plus years as a certification chair for AC Intermountain Chapter. He's certified to inspect reinforced concrete through ACI, PCI, ICC, MPCA, TTQP, ASQ, and he's experienced with QAQC inspections. They're going to talk about the basics of concrete inspections, so this should be very good. Hopefully, we were hoping to get a lot of transects in here. Hopefully, we've got a fair amount of you guys in here. As always, we have the roles to sign up. Uh, this is critical if you need continuing education units for your license, your engineer's license. Make sure you get your name on here. That's how they track it for the conference, and you can get that information. So I'll start these on each side. Okay, thanks, Scott. And, uh, you yeah. know, like Scott said, my name's Jeff Sadler. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, no, maybe, no? H how about that? Oh. Is that a little better? All right. Um, uh, like I said, my name is Jeff Sadler. Uh, have Scott Strader here today. What we're going to talk about uh, is the basics of concrete reinforcing steel or reinforced concrete. And uh, so hopefully, uh, how many people here are, are trans techs with uh, under like five years experience? Okay. <laughs> Well, we, we was hoping, because this is a basics course, so we was hoping to get some, uh, some new people here. We're basically going to go over the, uh, the basics uh, of concrete, of reinforced concrete. Uh, so uh, for you that are more experienced, uh, you'll get a little bit of a refresher here. Okay. Uh, so there are only two good steps to good reinforced concrete. Anybody uh, want to venture a guess on what those two steps are? No? Step one is to verify the quality of the material, and step two would be to verify the placement of the material. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go through those two steps and, and break those down into, uh, in, into pieces so we can kind of better define those. And, and notice the word verify on there as well. Uh, everything that we're doing out there in the field uh, needs to be verified, both good and bad. So, you know, uh, make sure that, uh, you know, when, when you're out there inspecting and, and working with concrete, uh, that you're, you know, documenting uh, both the good and the bad. And we'll go through that as well. Okay, so uh, the, the items that go into a good reinforced concrete. Um, so obviously you have your concrete, uh, you have your reinforcing steel, your rebar, uh, your WWF, uh, which is your welded wire fabric. Uh, you also have connections and, and different things that are embedded into the concrete, such as your, uh, your, your pavement tie, uh, tie bars or your dowel bars. Uh, you might have pre-stressing strands going through your concrete. And uh, also if you're working with MSE walls, you, you'll have the MSE straps and uh, you know, things like that. So there's a lot of things that are, that are found actually inside the concrete. So how do we verify uh, that we have quality concrete? You know, we have a, a lot of documentation checks. Uh, you know, we check that the ready mix truck supplier uh, is on the UDOT pre-approved list. And uh, so if you're going out on a job and you're uh, before you go out on a job, you're going to want to make sure that, you, you know, you know the, who the, the supplier is. You know, go onto the uh, UDOT website, uh, make sure that, you know, they, they are on that list, make sure that they're pre-approved. You get down into the, some of the southern regions of the state, some of those uh, trucks and, and batch plants come and, come and go. 
uh, you know, so you, know, you want to make sure that they're verified. Uh, you want to check that the, the ReadyMix truck itself has a uh, current UDOT sticker on them. Uh, those, are, uh, those trucks are inspected once a year, uh, as, as, so is the, the batch plants. Um, but there'll be a, an, an orange sticker on the trucks, uh, usually located inside the cabs. You want to make sure you verify that the, the, the truck is uh, okay. And um, uh, you also want to uh, check that you're using the proper mix design uh, when the concrete comes out on the job. So here's a picture of a pre-qualified batch plant uh, or a, ba a batch plant. And, and if you don't know uh, for sure how to get to the pre-qual list as far as who the pre-qualified uh, suppliers are, you go to the UDOT website under project development, uh, then you click on materials, uh, pre-qualified suppliers, and then go into the ReadyMix supplier link right there, and it'll bring up a list of all the, the pre-qualified uh, ReadyMix suppliers. Everybody kind of familiar with that anyway? Okay, it's a picture of the orange sticker uh, that you'll find inside the truck for the truck being pre-approved. Uh, located, generally it's located inside the cab. Again, that's a yearly inspection that's done. We go through and we check the, the fins of the truck, we check the water meter, the revolution counter, things like that, make sure that they're all working. You know, those are items that you're gonna wanna look at when you're out on the field. Um, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, they're not damaged or have been broken since the certification. And, you know, and then also you get the batch ticket. Those come out with, with each load of concrete. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that you pick those up when the, when the load comes out. Um, uh, when you're doing your testing results and stuff that we'll talk about in a minute, uh, you're going to be able, you know, want to write your test results on there. Um, uh, and another thing that you want to do is you know, make sure that uh, the batch ticket has the right mix design on it. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not getting a uh, load of post hole mud that was supposed to go to a different part of the project if you're doing PCC paving or something like that. So you know, check those batch tickets when, the, uh, when you get them from the truck. Make sure that it's, uh, the truck's in the right place where it's supposed to be on the job. Okay. Some other ways that we test if we have quality concrete uh, is uh, our on-site testing. You know, so we do the slump air, uh, check for the temperature, uh, and also make cylinders. Uh, you know, and it's very important when you're obtaining the sample to, um, uh, to sample fresh concrete uh, that you get a representative sample. Um, you know, that concrete, I mean, you're getting half a wheelbarrow load, and that half wheelbarrow load, you have to remember, represents, you know, probably up to maybe 50 yards of concrete that's going down before you do your next concrete test. So you want to make sure you, you know, you run a little bit out of the truck before. You don't want all the rocks and stuff that come out first. Uh, make sure that that uh, is representative uh, of the sample. And... You know, another thing is, you know, we, we operate off the minimum sampling and testing requirements, uh, the, and that's just like it says, a minimum. So if you're out there testing concrete and you see uh, a change in the mix at all, you know, you're, you're, you, know you should go through and pull another uh, air and slump and cylinder and do another uh, sample just to make sure that we're still getting the concrete that uh, we're specifying. Okay, so we check for slumps. Uh, slump is a, a good indication of consistency, uh, but it's really not a good indicator of your water cement ratio. Uh, with all the uh, air and training agents and everything that we have out there, you know, some of our concrete, you know, you'll, you'll pull a slump on it and it'll, you know, flatten right out. And, and that's actually what uh, some of those concretes are designed to do. Uh, so you, you'll want to, again, look at your specifications, make sure that you're uh, getting what you're supposed to be getting out there for, for whatever placement you're doing. Um, uh, but, but the slump test is, is a real good way of, of checking the consistency of the concrete. You know, another thing is uh, 
on the slump, if, if you've got a, a, a three inch slump that you pull and it may be within specifications for what you're doing, but you also have to look at the job that you're doing. Like if you're pouring a uh, 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 slip form uh, curb or barrier wall or something that, you know, as soon as that machine goes past, if you've got a three inch slump, it may be within specifications, but it's just gonna fall off, you know, so you gotta make sure that, you know, you want like a one inch slump or less. You know, there's a lot of things that you wanna really look at uh, depending on how you're actually uh, placing the concrete and in, in what application. So, so that's a, a, an important thing on the slumps. Um, we also check for air entrainment. Uh, air entrainment, uh, you can see here, uh, there's a, a couple of different types of meters here. Uh, the top picture is a, a pressure meter, uh, something you're probably all familiar with if you've tested concrete. Uh, pump it up, it, it, it tells the, uh, the amount of entrained air. And entrained air is the microscopic bubbles. It's not so much the big bubbles, but the, the microscopic bubbles inside the concrete that allow that durability. So for our uh, freeze-thaw cycles here in Utah, uh, that bottom picture there is a uh, picture of the uh, roller meter. Uh, it's also a, uh, it's actually called a volumetric meter. Uh, but uh, we use that in our, in our lightweight con concrete. Um, so, you know, some of you, if, we're, if you're dealing with lightweight concrete, then you're gonna uh, be using the roller meter. You wouldn't be using the pressure meter on that. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's a push right now to get somebody in every field crew uh, certified in the uh, volumetric meter uh, or the roller meter. Uh, so you might be seeing that come, uh, you know, pretty soon. So why would we check the air te or the concrete temperature of, of the mix? Anybody have any guesses on what concrete temperatures? You know, do we care what the, con the temperature of the concrete temperature is? You know, we actually do. Uh, you know, there, uh, it, it helps predict the strength uh, of the concrete. You know, warmer concrete means that it's, uh, you know, maybe may a high early strength uh, concrete. And so if, if that's the case, uh, you know, you're, you're going to uh, see your strength build a lot faster. Um, you also want to see if, uh, if you get a, a load of concrete out there and it's not a high early strength, but you're getting high temperatures, that concrete may, or that temperature may indicate that that uh, concrete's already going through the hydration cycle and already starting to set. So if that's the case, you're going to want to look at that batch ticket, you know, look at the batch time on it. Maybe the guy stopped for lunch or something on, uh, on his way to your project. That could be an hour old or something, and that concrete's already starting to set in his truck. And so when he poured out on the, the, the job, you know, it, it's basically worthless to us because it's, you know, it's already starting its initial set. So, you know, strength's really important to, uh, you know, to keep track of. And cylinders, you know, we all, we, we make those cylinders out in the field. Uh, uh, those cylinders are a great indication of uh, the potential strength of the concrete. You know, I say potential because, you know, those cylinders are all cured in ideal situations. You know, we, we handle them really carefully. We put them in a cure box out there on the job for the first 24 hours. It's all temperature controlled. Uh, then we bring them in, we put them in a cure lab, uh, and, you know, we break them in, you know, 28 days to get, uh, uh, to get, find out what the potential strength of that concrete is out there. You have to remember that the, the concrete that you're placing out there is, is uh, different than those cylinders. You know, this is just a good indicator of what that concrete's potential strength is. Uh, and we also use that potential strength to, uh, you know, to pay the contractors in their pay estimates. So... Um, when you're when you're handling those uh, cylinders, you know you want to make sure that you're you're doing it properly. Uh, you go through uh, the proper procedures. You're not tipping them. You're not, you know, uh, doing things that's going to cause those things to uh, break prematurely. Because uh, you know we're we're actually you know we want to get a, a good quality uh, concrete out there on our jobs. And if we don't have a, a good indicator of what's being placed out there, then you know we just don't know. 
Okay. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the specifications. You know, we have a lot of specifications here at UDOT. Uh, so if you're doing PCC or if you're doing sidewalk or you're doing uh, 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 SCC, you know, there, there's, there's specifications for everything. So you want to make sure you look at the right specification for the concrete that you're placing out there. Uh, and you may have to look in more than one place. You know, there, there's, there's different specifications that... Uh, uh, that deal with different things. So uh, just know that when, if you're doing sound wall or if you're doing uh, sidewalk or you're doing PCC, you know, look at the right specifications for what you're doing so that you're making sure that that concrete is actually the concrete that you want for that job. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Scott to kind of go over the reinforcing steel. I just was hitting the button. It was kind of cumbersome. Okay. All right. Like Jeffrey said, I'm going to talk a little bit about reinforcing steel and uh, what would you do in a pre-pour inspection. So how we verify the quality of the reinforcing steel, one of the things we can do is visual inspection of the bar markings. Uh, I handed out some quick reference little uh, plastic uh papers earlier people that didn't get them that didn't show up real early there's extra ones up here you can grab after you can try to <clears throat> look at your neighbor maybe now when we get to that point but another thing we can do we can do visual inspection of the coatings on the rebar or the reinforcing we can also do some documentation check check the mill certs of the reinforcing and at central materials we do perform verification testing of, of rebar also and uh, I'll get into that a little bit here in a minute. Okay, the bar markings. A lot of people aren't familiar with what those bar markings represent. Like you say, these little reference guides at CRSI, uh, the Concrete Reinforcing Steel Institute provided for us, kind of define some of that, and we'll get into that on these next few slides. But the bar markings give us a whole bunch of information. They tell us what mill the bar was produced at, the size of the bar, the type of the steel, the grade of the steel. Uh, lots of good information. <clears throat> Here's just a photo of some bar markings. Uh, if you look at this one specifically, the, the first two letters on the top are NU. That means it came from the new core plant here in Plymouth, Utah. Uh, underneath that, the number five. That's the size of the bar. This bar is 5 8 inch diameter, or number 5 bar. The S under that's the type of steel. This is a regular billet steel. And the grade 60 on the bottom, that represents the yield strength of the, of the rebar. So it's good to, good to know what those markings mean so you can check the actual quality of the steel before it gets placed. Here's a photo of some black bar. In this bar, what's different, under the NU, you can see there's a number 16. That's not uh, a standard size, that's a metric size. We'll get into the conversion here in one of these next slides. But there is a conversion between standard bar and metric bar. Normally, most of the plans come out and they're designed for standard size bar. It'll call for a number five or a number six bar. A lot of times you get in the field and you get the metric size, so you need to know the conversion. These handouts actually are the way to cheat on that and get the conversion, but I'll show you how to do the math also. It's pretty easy. <clears throat> okay, here's an example of how to convert the bar size. Basically, you just have to change them into decimal form. Standard size bar in this example is a number four bar, so it's four eighths of an inch in diameter. If you had punch in on your calculator, 4 divided by 8, you'll get 0 0.50. Uh, the metric equivalent, down below, as you see, metric, there's 25.4 millimeters in an inch. And so you take whatever the metric number is, in this case, number 13 bar, divide it by that 25 or 25.4, and you get 0.51 inches. Since that's slightly larger than 0.50, that's an acceptable uh, 
equivalent size bar. And like you say, the easiest way is just to use your cheat sheet here, but but everybody's got calculators on their phones nowadays and they can they can do this math out in the field fairly easily once they understand. Okay, another thing we can inspect prior to the concrete placement is the coatings on the bar. We've got different kinds of of coatings that we specify. We've got regular uncoated black bar, which is fairly uncommon here at UDOT. Most of the stuff is is uh, epoxy coated green bar, but we also do some galvanized stuff. We've also got other types of bars, stainless and stuff like that, that we experiment with. Okay, important to know about the black bar if it's uncoated. It needs to be loose or free from loose mill scale, thick rust, dirt, paint, oil, or grease. The emphasis on the thick rust, a little bit of rust is acceptable. Uh, as long as it doesn't change the diameter of the bar, the weight per foot of the bar, and it can be easily removed with a pencil eraser, then it's acceptable basically. Here's a photo of some galvanized uh, barrier loops. That's one of the types of coatings we can specify. The epoxy coated bar in this photo, we'll talk about uh, what, what you can check for as a visual inspection. When the epoxy bar shows up, if it's got nicks or scratches or if it's got cut ends, they need to be repaired. And the proper repair, the, the ideal repair is a two-part epoxy that you mix up and, and repair it. You can also use a spray epoxy per our spec, but we need to make sure we achieve the proper thickness. The thing to be aware of is if you're using a spray epoxy, you won't get that 8 to 12 mils that's specified with one coat. That's going to be multiple coats. If this stuff isn't... <clears throat> If it's not repaired, what happens, that moisture gets in behind the epoxy and, and will eat at, the, eat at the rebar and it actually kind of gets trapped. If you're not going to treat the epoxy bar good, then you're better off using black bar. If you use a epoxy bar properly and touch up all the nicks and scratches and cut ends, it's a good product, but you've got to be really careful with it. Okay, as far as reinforcing, you also should be able to pull mill certs on the different heat numbers that are provided to your projects. Uh, that's the testing that's done at the actual uh, producer or the steel mill as they produce this sticks of rebar and this welded wire reinforcing. They do their in-house testing, provide us with uh, results to show that they conform to our specification, that they meet that, <coughs> excuse me, that typical grade 60 that we call out and requirements like that. Here's an example of a mill cert. Looks like there's a heat number highlighted on this one for some reason or another. Okay, also we do pull samples when the truckloads of the reinforcing show up <coughs> on site. And they should show up with three what we call test bars, about two foot lengths of rebar with a tag on showing what the mill cert is. If anybody sees those in the field, try to make an attempt to call us at Central Materials. We'll come get those bars or have you deliver those bars and we'll test them. We'll put them in a machine, same machine that you can test cylinders in compression and we'll pull them in, in tension until they break and make sure that they conform to the strength requirements. There's a picture of some sample bars on our rack outside of the door at Central Materials that have been delivered in. And the main specification that handles the reinforcing steel is 03211 UDOT specification. Okay, besides uh, the reinforcing and the rebar, there's, there's other materials like uh, Jeffrey touched on that can be embedded into the concrete that we need to verify the conformance to the approved plans. We can check dimensions. Uh, we can check them against the cited ASTM or AASHTO standards. Uh, some of the stuff's not, not as easy to know what the requirements are, but it should be specified what materials and what dimensions of everything that's embedded in the concrete is. Okay, once we verify the quality of the reinforcing, we're on to the placement. And there's things we can check as part of the pre-pour inspection, check the reinforcing 
can check the formwork, check the reinforcement, and check the concrete itself, the way that it's placed. As far as formwork, the important thing is that it's going to produce concrete elements of the specified size and shape. Uh, in this top photo, just a photo of wood forms, which are typically single-use forms. Bottom photo is a reusable steel form in a precast yard. Okay, the things that you check as far as placement on reinforcement, you can check the spacing of the bars, the clear cover, the lap splices. Check that they're adequately supported with uh, the proper chairs and the cleanliness of the, of the bar. As far as the spacing of the rebar, you check it against approved plans or drawings. That's important. Make sure that the plans are stamped and approved that you're working off so you're not uh, working off a moving target. You can check the bar count and the spacing, but you need to make sure to apply for the, the tolerances. In the UDOT specification, 03211, it talks about tolerances. Uh, <clears throat> as far as like this picture showing a mat of, of rebar, the transverse tolerances, you might be surprised they could be as, as large as plus or minus three inches, that they can be placed different than what's shown on the plan. Uh, but that shouldn't change the amount of bar as far as the bar count, the number of bar that you count in there. Okay, rebar cover, that's the distance between the edge of the concrete and the steel. That's, that's how much the water and the chlorides would need to travel through the concrete to penetrate in the steel. Uh, let's see, there's a common misconception about rebar cover that it's only a minimum cover. And you need to realize that there's minimum and maximum placing tolerances on rebar cover. Typically, they're around a quarter inch, so that's a lot tighter than what the transverse spacing would be. That's, that's uh, a little more critical. Okay, as far as the placement of the reinforcing, you need to check lap splice also. The, the UDOT specification actually doesn't allow for lap splices unless they're drawn into the, the drawing. Uh, so you can't just randomly put lap splices. But what's... Uh, Interesting to know some of the old specification for the International Building Code used to call out that it was 40 bar diameter lap splice was, was typical and with epoxy reinforcing like we use on a regular basis that was 1.25 times as much made it 50 bar diameters and so if you do have a splice and it's not specified on the plan for some reason you're going to accept it that way uh, this example shows a number five bar gets over 31 inches of lap splice and so they to be able to get that developmental length you need to have you know a lot of lap splice I think it ends up being uh, for number four bar it's 25 inches okay also you need to make sure that when the concrete is placed the, the reinforcing is not going to change its position and get displaced so to do that, you need to have usually cha chairs in place to keep that clear cover distance. Uh, you know, our specification calls for chairs at every intersection unless, unless uh, the spacing is less than nine inches and then it's every other intersection. Uh, you need to make sure that there's plenty of chairs, especially if people are going to be walking around on the rebar like on a deck placement. Okay, another thing to do is make sure that, uh, you know, any of the oils and dirt that gets on the reinforcement during the placement process gets cleaned off before the placement. Okay, once you've checked and verified that all the steel's in the correct position, uh, there's some things to check as far as the placement of the concrete. You check the depositing of the concrete, consolidation of the concrete, and the curing methods on the concrete. As far as the depositing, uh, you want to verify that you're not getting in any segregation of the concrete uh, or any contamination. One thing that I think I go over in the next slide, you don't want to transport the concrete with a vibrator. You don't want to throw the vibrator up into the chute, drag it down into the, into the placement. That can cause some segregation. 
You also want to be aware of the temperatures, both of the concrete and of the contact surfaces, which are the rebar and the forms. Uh, concrete temperature is specified 50 to 90 degrees in our Portland cement concrete spec. And the contact surfaces should be between 36 and 95 degrees. There's things you can do to adjust that. If it's too hot, you can miss the forms or, or do what needs to be done to adjust the temperatures. Okay, as far as consolidating the concrete, uh, yeah, you don't, don't transport the concrete with the vibrator. The vibrator should only move straight up and straight down at a fairly steady rate. Uh, another thing to take into consideration is that uh, if the rebar is epoxy coated, the steel vibrator heads can damage that epoxy and nick and, and scratch it as it's being placed. And so those vibrator heads should be coated. They should have either a, a plastic or, or epoxy type coating on there to, to uh, protect the, the rebar. Okay, and then finally, after you get the concrete placed, you need to cure the concrete. All concrete needs to be cured by some method. Uh, this is when you protect it from the extreme hot and cold temperatures, and this is when you do some kind of a some kind of a method to either add some water to aid in the hydration process or contain water that's already in the mix to aid in the hydration process. We've just uh, done a rewrite to the 3390 specification, so if you're aware of that, you want to revisit it when it gets posted here in the next few days, see what the new uh, specification says, but that's still the same 0, 3390 U.spec. spec. And I think that's my portion. Okay, so the, the next step uh, that we're going to go through is uh, the documentation portion. Uh, the documentation is probably, uh, you know, the most important part of, of your job. Uh, I'm sure you've been told that, you know, document, 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 and if you don't think that you've done it before or enough, document it again. Um, you know, it's, it's really important uh, at, at the end of the job when once you've uh, placed concrete uh, or anything uh, to know what happened at that uh, uh, place where, where you did the testing and, and you know if there, that concrete blows up or something you know you want to be able to go back and look at you know different ways of, of why that might have happened so um, you know so when, like I said before when when a concrete truck shows up on the job you always want to uh, get a copy of that batch ticket um, uh, and, and it's also a great place to write your testing results down. So once you're, you're doing the testing, you write it down on that batch ticket. That way you, your testing information and that uh, batched truck information that you tested is all together. And then when you're doing your documentation, you also want to document where that load of concrete was actually placed. Uh, you know, if it was a sidewalk, you know, station such and such, or, you know, in a driveway approach, or, or whatever you were, uh, you're doing, deck, deck placement, whatever, uh, you want to make sure you, you document where that's at. So if that piece of PCC actually blows up uh, in, in the future, uh, they can actually go back and look at that and say, okay, here's the testing results, and this is, you know, where it was placed. Uh, this is, you know, that they have a good idea of as far as why that uh, that may have uh, be performing the way it is. Uh, here's a copy of the batch ticket. Uh, shows the uh, uh, the ambient temperature, the concrete temperature, uh, the air per, uh, that they they tested was 5.7 percent, and they got a uh, looks like a six and three quarter inch slump on the on the thing. They've just written it right there on the batch ticket, so it's it's uh, you know easily uh, found. Um, other things you want to include on your daily inspection report are, are the weather conditions. Um, you know, if if, if it's a, a raining that day and they're placing concrete, you know that's another indicator when when you come back and look at it and they see that the top's all spalled off and they they look at the your your inspection report. And they say, well, it rained that day. 
you know, it, it kind of helps to determine what's going on with that concrete. Uh, again, the description of the, the work being performed, uh, the location, um, you know, the locations for the samples, like I said. Um, you know, uh, also you want to make sure that you're writing down, uh, you know, what you did out on the job, all, all both conforming and non-conforming work. Um, you know, if, if you're out there documenting only the problems that are going out on the job and, and things like that, um, there's, if you have a day where there's nothing going wrong, you know, you're not putting any documentation down on it, when they go back and look at those records later, uh, you know, they have a hard time determining if anybody was even out on the job. So, you know, make sure that you're documenting things that go right on the job and the things that go wrong, especially the things that are going wrong, the non-conforming work. Uh, and, and with that, you want to make sure that you talk about any conversations that you're having with the contractor, uh, you know, what, it, what uh, those conversations were, so that, uh, again, you can go back and look at those and be able to, uh, you know, cover yourself if, if uh, you know, something goes south on you. Um, and, and like I said before, you know, the conforming work is just as important as the non-conforming work to document. And you want to make sure that you verify that you're out there, uh, you know, where the concrete was placed, from what station to what station, uh, you know, every, everything about it. Because uh, it just shows that you're out there uh, doing your job and that uh, everything was covered adequately uh, come time to pay the contractor or if there's any problems. You know, used to be when I was coming up through the ranks, uh, the attitude was, you know, of the inspector was, you know, it was always kind of adversarial between the, the inspector out there and the contractor. Uh, you know, we're always out there trying to get uh, that contractor and catch him doing something wrong or, uh, you know, uh, it, it was never a, a, a partnership type relationship. And, you know, throughout the years, UDOT's really changed for the better. Uh, because we, we now partner with our, our contractors out there. We both want the same thing. You know, we want a quality product. He's getting paid for it, we're pay, uh, and we're paid to inspect it to make sure that we're getting a quality product. And, and so you should be working with your contractor uh, every day, talking to him, you know, finding out what he's doing, wh where he's placing concrete, what time you need to be out there to uh, pass off the grade or to test the concrete, and you know, work with them, and and you'll find that uh, the the contractors will work with you as well, because uh, like I say, all you, all you're doing is looking for the same goal. You're still wanting uh, a quality uh, product out there, something that when that project's done. And, and you're driving it, you kind of get that sense of pride saying, hey, you know, I helped build this. Uh, and that, that helps a lot. Um, again, communication, big, huge thing. Uh, um, so you talk to that contractor, ask them why they're doing something. Uh, you know, if you see something that the contractor's doing out there, uh, kind of looks suspicious, you know, go up and talk to them. You know, say, hey, you know, why are you doing it this way? You know, there may be a supplemental sep uh, specification out there or something that you're, you're not quite aware of. Um, you know, he may be doing something that he's not quite, you know, he may have done it differently on a different project and come back and doing it, um, you know, with different specifications on your project. You know, the, 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 uh, the key is communication, talking to him and, and making sure both of you are on the same page. You don't want to get to the point at the end of a, uh, a pour or something and come up after and say, hey, you know, you might have to rip all this out because, you know, this is not done right. You know, you want to make sure that you're, you're as upfront with them uh, as soon as possible. Um, and, and also, when you do talk to the contractor, you know, you want to make sure that you put that down in your diary notes or your daily inspection notes, uh, just what that contractor, uh, that conversation was. Uh, so that you have documentation that you told the contractor that you saw this and, you know, you may be allowing this uh, concrete to be left in place, but you want to make sure that you cover yourself, that you're, you know, you, that you've documented and, and he was aware of the problem beforehand. Uh, and, you know, we hear this from our senior leaderships and all the time, you know, being professional out on the job, uh, and that's key. You know, you, you know you're dealing... Uh, in a professional manner, you're, you're representing the state, 
Um, but, but more than that, it makes you look good. If you're acting professional out there on the job, you're going to get more contractors that are respecting you. Even if you're telling them that, they're doing, you're, that they are doing something wrong, um, if you're telling them and you're acting in a professional manner, they, they, they respect you for that. You know, they know you're just doing your job. And, and same way with the, the contractor. You know, if, if, if they're being professional back with you, you know, you respect that from them. You know that they're out there to build a job and, and you want that uh, um, equal um, standard between you, the two of you as far as being, a very, being professional. Um, if you do see something that's going south, the contractor's doing something wrong, you, didn't, you never want to stop the work. You don't just go up there and say, hey, you got to stop your, your work, this is not right. Um, you know, you document what, what you saw, you go up and talk to the contractor. The only time you can really stop work on a project, being a UDOT inspector, is if you see somebody in an in imminent danger. You know, if they're down in a trench working or if there's something that, you know, you know that guy's going to get hurt in the next five, ten minutes. You, yeah, you can stop that portion of the job and say, we need to get this guy out of here or, or whatever. That's all OSHA stuff. Um, but if, if they're just placing concrete and you see something they're doing wrong, you, you know, you don't want to stop that job. Um, but just make sure you talk to the contractor and make sure that, you know, that they understand that you see a, pr a problem and that you need to work that through. Talk to your uh, superintendents. Okay. Any any, uh, any questions for Scott or I? Okay. Great. We do have these handouts. Uh, we handed out some to to everybody before. Uh, we do have some extras up here on the front desk. Uh, if you did not get one, or if you'd like one, or if you need one for your buddy back home, you know, come up. We've got a few left up here. Uh, other than that, thank you very much. Have a great conference. Go and enjoy lunch. One other thing, if you are from out of state and you need a continuing education unit, we have worksheets up here we can fill out for you. Otherwise, get your name on the roll. Thanks.